Good morning, GCC. Good to be together in this virtual space for another week. I'm Jen, and I'm here with Kelly, and we have prepared some worship, and we're excited to just be able to come into the presence of the Lord and um, do that in a way that we still have a, a community aspect here. And so I just pray that our time, just Lord, would you be welcome and full everywhere, everywhere that's tuning in right now, that your presence and your spirit would just, just make yourself known, Lord, make yourself known. I pray that you yourself would bring us into that connection um, even reconciliation with ourselves, with you, that connection with each other. We honor you. We love you today, Lord. Just be, be worshipped, be honored in our worship today. never known love like yours so intimate so powerful and I've tasted and I've seen and nothing comes close never known love like yours Jesus your name is power it's breath and living water your spirit guides me to the heart of the father let your praise ring louder every day and every hour it's your spirit guides me to the heart of the father i've never felt home like this like a child so innocent. innocent now I'm safe inside your arms cause you won't let go I've never known love like yours Jesus your name is power it's breath and living water your spirit guides me to the heart of the Father, let your praise ring louder every day and every hour. Cause your spirit guides me to the heart of the Father. Jesus, your name is power, it's breath and living water. Your spirit guides me to the heart of the Father. Let your praise ring louder every day and every hour. Your spirit guides me to the heart of the Father. I've never felt home like this felt at home like this. just like a child so innocent. so innocent and I'm safe inside your arms cause you won't let go I've never known love like yours Jesus your name is power it's breath and living water your spirit guides me to the heart of the Father. Let your praise ring louder every day and every hour. Your spirit guides me to the heart of the Father. Sing praise. God, we sing praise. 
God, we sing praise. We sing praise. God, we sing good. Your love endures forever. You are so worthy of our praise. The day, the night, and every season, in the winter seasons, God, you're so worthy. You hold us, you keep us, you never let us go. Your love never lets us go. We love you. And there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Ooh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, such a power in coming together and just receiving the strength of what it means to come together in community, remind each other, remind ourselves the goodness of God. I know there's some situations and it would help me to just remember, just put the goodness of God over those situations. Just the faith yeah, that faith lens to see things again with the eyes of faith. 
Yeah, thank you, Lord, that we could be strengthened today, God, through this worship time, just turning our eyes to you, turning our eyes to you again, God, declaring your goodness today, God. Every situation we're in may not be good, but you're still good. be there. I will always be by your side. Just look up. I'm right there. Just look up and reach for my hand. I'm right there. There'll be times when you're up and times when you're down. I'm never too far. Just look around and you'll find me I'm by your side Arms open wide Oh, I am good You are loved mm -hmm. I am good You are loved be times when you're up and times when you're down I'm never too far just look around and you'll find me I'm by your side arms open wide oh I am good you are loved please believe I am 
good you are love I won't let you down no I am good you are love mm -hmm. you are loved oh you are loved, you are loved. no matter what you are Old things have passed away Your love has stayed the same Your stark constant grace remains a cornerstone Things that we thought were dead Breathing in life again you cause your sun to shine on darkest nights For all that you've done we will pour out Our love this will be our anthem song Jesus we love you Oh how we love you you are the one our hearts adore. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. have found their hope the orphans now have a home all that was lost has found its place in you you lift our weary head you make us strong instead you took these rags and made us beautiful For all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be our anthem song Jesus we love you oh how we love you you are the We love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one in our hearts. Hearts at all. Hearts adore, my heart adore, your heart 
adore you. We adore you. Hearts adore. Adore. Adore you. Our hearts adore. 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 Happy Sunday. Welcome to our community. Welcome to Greater Chicago Church. Thank you for being here. Thanks for being with us live or catching up on a podcast later. Thanks for just being part of our community. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm JD. I am the senior leader here with my wife. We co-lead this beautiful community of faith and we're excited. It's not exactly the way I wanted to do the first two Sundays of the year. I wanted to be able to give you guys high fives and I wanted to hug and I wanted to see everybody and welcome everybody to 2022. But we're surging in Chicagoland and this seems like a safe and effective alternative. And so um, we've been at this two years. We know the ropes. We understand how to do it. I even set up my own lighting tonight. If it's a little bright, I'm sorry. Um, that does happen sometimes. Um, a couple of real quick announcements. I'll keep them brief. One, a reminder, January 30th, last Sunday of the month, we are not going to meet on Sunday morning. Our plan is to have dinner. Sunday night, I'll provide the main dish. You'll provide the desserts and the sides. And um, we are going to gather and we're going to discuss um, some of what we've talked about for the last few weeks, which will be uh, questions about the Bible or some um, things about faith. And we're just going to have community time. It's going to be great. Uh, I'm super excited, super hopeful, and praying that we will have 
it's kind of a break in the action from the, the COVID hysteria that is currently really sweeping across our nation. So um, I continue to pray for the health and well-being of our community, but my goal is January 30th, we're all in here together having a meal. At the end of January, we're also gonna try and squeeze in a members meeting. Not exactly sure what night that's gonna be. We will send out communication. It'll probably be uh, like an eight to 9 p.m. on Zoom. Um, I will make a small presentation, kind of give you a budgetary overview, uh, talk about a few changes from a structural perspective, but nothing grand. And then we'll, uh, yeah, we'll just kind of have an open question and answer. You can ask me questions probably more specifically about money and budgets and stuff instead of theology and uh, faith. So, and then I've been tossed around this idea and I'd like to weigh the public opinion, but I mentioned it the other day on a, on a call that I would really like to do a Super Bowl party again, February 13th, and I'd like to have a chili cook-off. So this is your chance to bring your best chili. This is your chance to bring, you know, like six to eight servings that you're gonna share and we'll have a couple of judges and um i actually am going to enter i'm going to have my own chili in the uh, contest so i will not be a judge but i will find good judges and i would like to challenge all of you to come and beat my chili and watch some commercials um that kind of like happen in between like the football plays so if that sounds interesting to you i'd like to uh put that on your radar so you can start buying your materials now i know that some of you have a very exquisite chili list that needs time for, to be prepped. So uh, those are my three announcements for the day. Let's kick it off. I'm starting a new series today, which is called Question and Answer. And, and I'm probably gonna change that title because it's just a little bland for me. But the idea was I would open up my inbox and I would take any questions from you guys, whether, uh, specifically around faith or theology or Christology or the Bible or anything. And my inbox got a bunch. I currently have like 14 or 15 or 16 very complicated questions that involve like six or seven question marks in the actual question. So it's it's big. Um, and yeah, those are, uh, <laughs> they range from everything from like theology to uh, one on communion, one on the afterlife. Um, some really beautiful things about suffering and life and death. And I look forward to kind of getting through all of these. I don't know how many we'll end up doing, so it's kind of an open-handed uh, series. But I will try and wrap a few of these together and try and get like some, some clarity around some of the pieces that kind of fit together. However, before I get started, two things to remind you. First, if you have your um, personal communion, we will close with communion today. I actually have mine this time. Um, you feel free to pause me at any point and go grab yours or, you know, I'm probably mobile, whatever. Just take me around. And uh, my other big disclaimer is this. My other big thing is just because you and I disagree does not mean that you need to leave this church or this community. In fact, I disagree with a lot of you on a lot of things, and that's fine. And we disagree about the way we read scripture, and we disagree about the way we understand the text, and we disagree about what was said. We disagree on how we read, what we actually hear or say or heard said. We disagree on tons and tons of things. But I'm incredibly committed to this relationship. You and me and us, I want us to find a way to live harmoniously. Now that doesn't mean in some weird homogenistic soup. It means that we all carry a beautiful piece to this journey. And I said last week that a spiritual journey is intensely individual and worked out in community. And I believe that because you're going to see things and hear things and engage with things in different ways than I can. And part of that is because my lens is shaped by my experience. I have lived 42 years of life and those chapters and pages of my story have helped me see the world the way I do. Now you might see it differently and that's fine. 
And so I just want you to know that disagreement is fine. If you get really offended, I'm super sorry. I re- I'm not here to offend you. I am here to challenge you and provoke you, to push you on your spirit- spiritual journey, because I believe that at the end of the day, that's where we want to be. We want to be pushing forward towards that goal, running the race that Paul calls us to run. Now, um, if you do uh, really, if I really do step on your toes, I am sorry. And please email me or text me and let's go grab a coffee and let's talk about it. And uh, like I said, I'm super committed to us, like piecing it together. I mentioned that uh, some of these questions were incredibly deep and complicated and complex. And some of them were light and airy. And I'm actually going to start on a light and airy one today. It feels like that's just the mood. I'm not physically in front of you. So, hey, let's just kind of be light. Let's talk about it in um, nice, easy ways. And so the question was this. I'm going to read it. Who do you think Paul was? How does his influence shape the New Testament? I have often heard you, JD, say that you aren't a huge fan of Paul. Why? He seems to have written over half of our New Testament and truly shaped theology. Can you help me understand? Thank you. That's a good question. So let's dive in. Who's Paul? Who is Paul? So first of all, Paul, born Saul, was a Jewish theologian, a Pharisee, and he was trained under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was this first century rabbi Pharisee who was the grandson of Hillel, the elder. I don't know if you'll remember um, back when we had the discussions, I think it was in Mark when we were talking, when there were two schools of thought, and when when they asked, uh, when, when the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus and say, you know, how do we interpret the laws of Moses about divorce and getting rid of your wife if she is not what you want? And there were two schools of thought. Hillel is the side that Jesus almost sides with exclusively. And the grandson is Gamamiel. And Gamamiel is Paul's instructor. And so there's a really interesting and unique thread that's pulled through this thing. Um, if you'll recall, back in that same conversation in Mark, I made this statement, and I stand by this, that Jesus and the Pharisees weren't actually enemies. Um, depending on how long you you can read the text a couple of different ways, but it looks like Jesus's ministry lasted between one and three years. And in that time, I'd like to think of Jesus and the Pharisees kind of as boxing, sparring partners, and Jesus always won. Or at least the authors recorded that Jesus always won, right? And uh, it's kind of like this little thing where they just keep going back and forth, asking harder and harder questions, telling stories, mixing parables, feeding the 5,000, and then teaching. And it's, um, they aren't enemies. However, Jesus goes into Jerusalem, and one week later he's crucified because the Sadducees uh, took him to to court, basically, and threw him in in jail. And the Sadducees are this, like, ruling, governing body of the Jewish uh, faith back then. Okay, one last thing to say about Paul's, like, tutelage and upbringing. One of Gamaliel's, like, number one things that he was super intense about from all the writings that we have that kind of talk about him is his idea around leniency for Jewish converts to Christianity. And if I think about the early life of Paul, Saul, at that time, he persecuted these believers. In fact, the Sadducees had signed his paperwork that said he could imprison them or kill them in certain cases, which murder is against the Jewish code, and yet here it is, sanctioned. And so, um, yeah, Paul wasn't a lenient individual. He was pretty dogmatic in his persecution of followers of the way, right? And so um, that all radically changed, right? Paul radically changed on the road to Damascus when a bright light shines down, knocks him off his, his horse, lands him on the ground, speaks to him, blinds him, and sends him 
into the city to wait, to wait. Now, interestingly, um, Paul actually gives a couple different accounts of this story, and they don't all line up. And that's one of those things that always bothered me early on until I realized that when you are speaking with different audiences, you highlight different parts of the story. And I think Paul was one of these individuals who was such a fine communicator that at certain points, it was to his advantage not to bend the truth, but to highlight certain pieces. And so that was one of my first things that I was like, hmm, Paul's kind of interesting and intriguing. Um, at that point, I think I still liked Paul. I, I don't dislike Paul, and I, I'll get to that, I promise. So um, he was a thinker. He was a writer. Um, he was prolific. Most scholars, not all, but most scholars would argue that Paul's first language is Greek. Um, now, there is some conversation around him speaking Aramaic, which would have been the common Hebrew tongue. He is from the tribe of Benjamin. He was raised in a devout home in Tarshish. Um, however, um, the way he writes and the letters that are, that are under his name follow almost like a Greek, like, almost like Stoicism. There's like a philosophical Stoic way of talking, and, and a lot of Paul's arguments are actually framed in that context. And so um, he's bilingual. He is this incredible writer and communicator, kind of got a hothead. There's a couple passages in Scripture where he gets in fights and sends people off, but uh, for the most part, yeah. He's just a brilliant individual, a theologian. He's given credit for writing 14 books of the New Testament, historically given credit for 14 books. Now, modern scholarship has cut that number down significantly. Um, currently, the most modern scholarship I could find gives him credit for actually writing seven, those being the Book of Romans, which is his how do you say it, magnum opus, like his seminal work, his, th this is the piece that he put every bit of it into, which is why I would like to do Romans later this year um, as we kind of start to work through the New Testament. Romans, Galatians, First and Second Corinthians, Thessalonians, and Philemon. And now you're all sitting there thinking, wait a minute, my favorite book is Ephesians or Philippians or... No one ever says Titus, but um, <laughs> but yeah, those those books are actually uh, dis disputed over their authorship. Um, Philippians is one of those books that is still intensely debated. There's people on both sides that I respect, um, but for um, a consensus view, Second Thessalonians, Colossians, Ephesians, First and Second Timothy, and Titus all are under pen names. Now, this was a shock to me. I, Paul, write these things to you, not Paul. Okay, wait a minute. I was kind of raised in this camp where scripture was true. Well, scholarship can show you that these letters use different words, different conventions, structures that are found nowhere else particularly not found in Romans, which is Paul's, like, giant power work, right? You're like, well, that's interesting, and they make really good and compelling arguments. But it bothered me. Now, if you've done any reading within the text or scripture, you'll know that uh, Isaiah is really three or four books cobbled together, and they take place over about a 200-year period, about 170 years. Isaiah the prophet was not alive for all of those years. He was alive at the beginning, and then students of Isaiah probably finished out the prophecies and put together everything, and because they were students of Isaiah, they were able to say, this is the prophecy of Isaiah. Um, that could be happening for Paul, but this really started to irk me. Um, I can't quite 
I, I don't know quite how to describe it, but it made me frustrated. It was my first big problem with Paul. However, it actually solved a second one of my problems, which we'll get to in a second. Now, you'll also notice that some of the problem passages that the church has wrestled with for millennia are actually found in books like First and Second Timothy, right? Um, they're not penned by Paul. Um, huh, that's interesting. These books display like a church hierarchy that wasn't around in the first century, especially in like 50 or late mid 50s to late 50s when Paul is writing most of his, his works. And you realize like, oh, this is probably like second or third century writing, maybe 150 years after Paul, written in Paul's name, but oh, these ideas, maybe these aren't Paul's. And so that starts to help me unravel some of my angst against Paul. Because to be honest, um, I realized pretty early on that the difference between Jesus the rabbi and Paul the author and teacher was pretty substantial. And I realized that I fell in love with the Christ. I fell in love with this figure, this messianic figure who walked around and sat on the hills and preached and did the miraculous. And I wasn't really enamored with the rules and regulations, the theology and the working out of all the pieces that Paul lays out. And so um, I just started to break it down for myself. And I said, you know, Christ is all about, like he's in a, Christ is this weird anomaly, right? And I know we are all the Christ. I, I, like, I get it, but like Jesus was this very unique individual. He had a very Jewish message to a very Jewish audience. And yet there were hints, little bits and pieces of letting Gentiles into the mix. Um, the gospel writers, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, aren't really concerned with correcting theologies. They aren't really concerned with the dogmas of the day. Um, John, being a much later work, probably 30, 40, 50, even 60 years later than some of the other works, depending on how you date it, um, almost feels as if the writer of John is trying to correct some of the Paul letters that are floating out there and to remind people of this like beautiful man, Jesus, and the way of Jesus. And for me and for our church and our community, I've made this like declaration that our goal is to live more Christ-like. It's not actually to live more Paul-like. And there's a, there's a distinction there. Now, not saying that Paul was a bad person, but I want to live like Jesus. I want to live like Christ. I don't want to live like Paul. Um, Paul had established a bunch of churches. He planted churches, he tutored, he would mentored, he would stayed for weeks and months in places, raising up leaders, making sure they understood the kingdom and the good news, right? Um, and he did it through like this philosophical reasoning. Like when you think of Paul in the Areopolis, like he is rationalizing with these, these philosophers. You have a statue to the unknown God. Let me convince you that this is why the unknown God is this God and why this God is the dominant God. And very interesting, but very um, legal, um, almost like a democratic system. Like I'm going to give you the logical reasons why this is true and you are going to follow suit. Now, I am a pragmatist. I love logic. I don't necessarily love logic in faith. Uh, faith supersedes my logic. It always has, and it frustrates me. But Paul doesn't seem to have, I, maybe he does. But for me, Paul just, shoot, man, he just tries to, he tries to badger me into a corner, I feel like. And so um, his, his conversations in Acts and in Romans and in Corinthians are all based on this concept of like legal proof. Yeah, 
as 21st century Western thinkers, I can imagine like we all appreciate his rhetorical stuff, but none of us have a good grip on the religious baggage that Paul was talking about. And so some of the arguments we've recrafted and reframed in our own mind, and they become these, these horses that we ride on. And oftentimes we, we marginalize people with Paul's writings. And, um, and that's been tough. Like you think about the big sin list, uh, sin hit list in like Romans 1. Like we marginalize people that fall into that category. At least maybe you don't, but very candidly, I certainly used to. I try not to, but people who do such things, my goodness, they are such sinners and they need to be saved by grace. It's like Jesus had this different message. It was just like, hey, just love on them. Show them the difference. Show them what love means. And so my angst for Paul really grows out of that place, right? You think about Paul and his writing, at least the ones that are classically, I mean, attributed to Paul, talking about women losing all their sense of personal agency, not being allowed to lead, um, having to wear a head covering. Now, that's a very funny story. We could talk about that some other day. Remind me. Um silent but not and not heard you know don't speak in church like all these things and these have these ideas that are canonized have oppressed marginalized individuals for too long and before i understood that these weren't all pauline text i really couldn't stand paul for what he said i have a my mother is a pastor um she and my father lead used to lead a church. It's now my sister. Um, I've grown up with powerful women. And to have to rationalize Paul's writings against women were really tough. And it's weird because you contrast it with some of Paul's other writings. And he's like, please tell all of these women, thank you. Please let them know that they have blessed me beyond measure. Thank you for supporting me. And thank you for the first female apostle. It's like, oh, he really liked, but then he doesn't. And so I had this love-hate with Paul. And I don't think I've ever gotten over it. I think I think in my mind, it's Jesus versus Paul. And I know, I know that sounds crazy. And I'm trying to be as honest and as candid as possible. It's about the kingdom is coming versus the kingdom is here. Jesus had this message that the kingdom of God is coming. And I understand Jesus dies, ascends, sends the Holy Spirit, power now. I get it. I grew up in the vineyard, more love, more power. Come as you are, you'll be loved. I get it. The meat is in the street. We're doing this stuff. Like I can do all the old things. I can talk about the vineyard way and the vineyard model of Holy Spirit. But there's also this thing of like, the kingdom isn't fully here. Because if it was, there would be no sickness and there'd be no suffering. There'd be no, there'd be no pain. So how do I take that message? Well, it's the now, but not yet. Well, now we're in some weird rationalization. And I get it. It is the now, but not yet. That's a reality. I just don't like it. Maybe that's not the right word to say, but... Here, here's where I land. I see so many Christians being eager and willing to engage with Paul being willing and eager to follow Paul's teachings. I just don't see very many being willing to follow the teachings of Christ. And not that they're polar opposites, not that they're opposed to each other, but there is that degree of separation. And for me, I want to look more Christ-like. I don't want to look more Paul-like. I think Paul actually understood this. I'm going to read a, a I'm going to chop up a, a portion of uh, 1 Corinthians 3, but I think Paul understood this. I think he got it. I think he saw what was happening. And when he writes to the church in Corinth, yes, he's writing about himself and Apollos, but he's also alluding to this larger picture of like, hey, this is the Christ way. This is the way that Jesus taught us. Um, this isn't just me. And so I get it, Revelation um, and it changes and it evolves and it morphs. I just, I want to look more Christ-like. So in 1 Corinthians 3, 
Paul writes, um, Brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I found it impossible to speak to those who are... Uh, I, found it, I found it impossible to speak to you as those who are spiritually mature. You are still dominated by mindset of the, the mindset of the flesh. And because you are immature infants in Christ, I had to nurse you and feed you with milk, not solid food of the more advanced teachings because you weren't ready for it. I'm going to skip down a little bit. And he says, If so, this proves that you are living for your lives centered for yourselves, dominated by mindsets of the flesh and behaving like a group of unbelievers. For when you divide yourself into groups, a Paul group and an Apollos group, you're acting like people without the Spirit's influence. And who is Apollos, really? Or who is Paul? Great question. Aren't we both just servants through who the whom you believe our message? Aren't each of us doing the ministry of the Lord that the Lord has assigned to us? I planted churches. Apollos came and cared for them, but it was God who caused them to grow. This means that the one who plants is not anybody special, nor the one who waters, for it is God who brings the supernatural growth. And I think Paul's saying in this piece, he's saying like, look, I might have planted these churches and I might have given you like this theological understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it. But to be honest, you really should be focused on God. You really should look to Christ and have this model. It doesn't matter if you have the most eloquent theological discourse. If you can't love the person next to you, regardless of how they look, you're doing it wrong. And so, um, yeah, it's not that I don't like Paul. I don't like the way I was taught about Paul. I like Paul. I like that Paul put himself on the line and ultimately died for his faith. He was a man um, on a mission and convicted to finish the race well, right? Even if he did not pen that line. I'm okay with that. And I've said it a couple of times. I want to look more Christ-like, not more Paul-like. And... Uh, yeah, my hope is that in that you will find some some nuggets, some something something you can grip onto and realize that yeah, that's what I want too. I want to look more like Christ. Okay. That's question 1. The other ones might not be so candid, but that one was and that was fun. So thank you for that. Um I'd like to take communion. So you can pause me. Good. Pause is over. And now we're going to uh, take communion together. So um, I like communion. I really love our habit of taking it once a week. I, I found it from a pastor that uh, I follow. And he talks about needing the Eucharist weekly. I was like, that's really a cool idea. Um, unfortunately, our, our elements are still in the little thingies, and so um, they aren't as delicious as bread and wine, but one of these days we'll get back to it. All right, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to stand. So at, uh, as the dinner was going, Jesus took the cup. He took the bread. He gave him the bread, and he said, take this. And eat this. This is my body broken for you. Do likewise. And then when the meal had finished, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood. It's been poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Spirit, I thank you for an opportunity to gather. Thank you for an opportunity that digitally we can be together. I thank you that you've oriented my life in such a manner that I have an intense desire to be more like Christ. I ask you bless our community. Keep them safe. We pray health and prosperity into everyone. I stand against infection, colds, flus, COVID's sickness. I thank you that you're an abundant God. Bless your name. Amen. Awesome.
Thanks for hanging with us. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. And if you'd like, we will be in a Zoom room at 1130. We'll see you there.